with my great pleasure, I'd like to introduce our uh, presenter, uh, Kathleen Opi, to you tonight. I don't have to actually uh, mention this much, but uh, I have a great sort of respect to the uh, uh, photographers and people who actually capture the moment in the home. Especially uh, when I first finished my own project, like a very small house, and I wasn't sure if I should publish or not. Then, then the publisher, actually I still remember the editor, came to me and said, you know what, your building might not last long, but the photograph will stay forever. <laughs> that was the time I learned that uh, actually as a medium, the, the architecture have a short life than the photography. Um, Kathy Opi lives and works in Los Angeles. She currently teaches in a studio program in a UCLA art department. Uh, Kathy Opi's photographs include a series of portrait and American urban landscapes, uh, ranging in format from large scale color works to smaller black and white prints. Moving from the territory of the body to the framework of the city. Opie's various photographic series are linked together by a conceptual framework of co uh, cultural portraiture. She aspires to continue to make work that engages with a space, the existing, and the politics of identity. She has exhibited extensively both nationally and internationally. Select solo exhibitions include Kathiopi, Figure and Landscape at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Kathiopi, American Photographer at the Guggenheim Museum in New York, Kathiopi, Chicago at the Muse Chicago at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago. Opi was 2009 recipient of the President Award for Lifetime Achievement from Women's uh, Caucus for Art and was awarded a United States Artist Fellowship in 2006. So please welcome Kathy Opi. nervous about presenting a lecture to a school of architecture, even though I've lectured all over the world. Um, and I just, and I, and I kind of wanted to definitely frame my work in relationship to the ideas that I have about the spaces that we inhabit. And so I've left out enormous amounts of other bodies of work um, to really kind of begin to look at uh, more fuller bodies of work. So normally when I'm discussing the American cities in a lecture, I'll put maybe three of Wall Street in. But what I've done today for this lecture, which hopefully it might work or it might not work, and it's an experimentation, is I've decided to leave the bodies of work in its totality. So meaning that you'll be able to see literally all the different images from the various bodies of work versus like really editing it down. So in some ways it might be banal, but I think that you guys really like to look at buildings, hopefully, so maybe it won't be. <laughs> so, but I'm going to start off, actually, with a, with a little history. And that, this is my first self-portrait, and it's uh, taken in 1970, and I grew up in Sandusky, Ohio, until I was 13. And then I moved to Southern California, to uh, uh, North County, San Diego, in a little town called Poway. And one of the things that I really love about this image is that it, you know, obviously defines a young butch dyke at this time period right. without being able to kind of name my own sexuality within it. But that it has my little, you know, Ohio suburban house behind it. And I have always played around and been curious, even from the, this age. At this age, besides the self-portrait, I was making photographs of every stop sign, every fire hydrant. I was mapping out my neighborhood of Sandusky. And I would have to say that it's a practice that I have continued to do, that I really believe in a certain extent 
that besides my curiosity in terms of ideas of specificity of identity, that there is a certain mapping that I'm trying to obtain in relationship to creating documents of various communities. So going from uh, Sandusky, Ohio in 1970, we're going to start out with the master plan, which in some ways was the beginning of really understanding um, what I was trying to do in relationship to this mapping. And I, I lived in San Francisco, and I was a very hardcore street photographer. And all of a sudden, I, you know, get it. I get, uh, you know, I get into Cal Arts for my master's degree for going to the, my, my master's. I didn't have a car because I had lived in San Francisco. So even though I was from Southern California, I had divorced myself from an automobile. So I was out there in Valencia, California, in 1985-86 with no car, wondering what the hell am I going to photograph after being a street photographer for a number of years. And I started reading, and basically what happened is I, the Valencia was, moving to Valencia, California in 1986 was the same as me watching Ranch of Bernardo, California develop in North County, San Diego to a master plan community in the, uh, in the uh, mid 70s or late 70s. So I opened this with a Robert Penn Warren quote, the dream is alive, but the dreaming is true. And my exploration of Valencia it, it kind of became a complete obsessive two-year examination of why people choose to live in master plan communities. Like, what is it? What is that, that ideal? Is it, it, can, it can't only be white flight. There has to be these other kind of mechanisms to uh, make this choice to kind of leave the major urban areas and go. So I started examining it by making a series of landscapes. This, land, this, this is what you would see in the uh, late 80s going down the five, which no longer is there because it's Stevenson Ranch. Um, and then this is, uh, this is actually the exact, fairly close to the site where that sign was taken. So this is a contemporary image of where, what that landscape has, has disappeared to. Um, but with it, I began to like, examine the way that they advertised the community. So it was obviously, we come home to Valencia, it was baseball, playing boys, and really scary looking children on the billboards <laughs> that you really wouldn't want to come home to. But they were there selling it as a place to come home to. Um, and it was, you know, it was, a, it was the, the kind of quote of Master Plan Living, which was also what I grew up with in, in Ranch Bernardo, was a place where one could work, live, and play. So it was this notion of no longer did you have to commute to the urban areas, although we know that it's not true because we know what the freeways are like coming from that area. And um, so with it, I, I started really kind of almost beginning to think about how do you look at this place and begin to kind of deconstruct it in a certain way from what it is to document. I, I've always been interested, and I told my parents when I was nine that I was going to be a social documentary photographer. And so, but at a time period in the 80s when everything was being kind of up in the air in relationship to what a document did as a photograph, you had, you know, Sherry Levine coppering Walker Evans images, you had Cindy Sherman, you had Paul Asari, like things were really changing on a conceptual level in relationship to the valid of a photograph actually holding its own as a document. And so I decided, well, okay, I can't just make new topographic photographs. That was done in the 70s. Robert Adams did it beautifully. I mean, Joe Deal. I can no longer kind of go in that realm of being a new topographic photographer. So I was doing color, which was kind of against new topographics. There weren't people really using color, except for Stephen Shore. And I started taking the text that I found in the, uh, the, um, the uh, rules and regulations of the community and mirroring it with these construction photographs. So single family residents, uh, residential, all residents shall only be used for the residential pur purpose of a household. You had temporary structures. So I began to like kind of mirror the language of the master plan and what it was trying to become with the actual construction of it. 
This is one of my favorite ones about animals, and I just kind of felt like all of these cement bags ended up being like discarded carcasses of animals. And it's no animal, livestock, or poultry of any kind should be raised, bred, or kept upon the covered property except that dogs, cats, or other household pets may be kept on the residence, and so on, and so on, and so on. So I was like really trying to literally kind of bring in the language that all of these people would have to abide by in relationship to the construction site that was almost antithetical to what the language being presented was. Um, then it was really just basic construction photographs. So, and the, you know, the, these are, this body of work is so much about the fact that when I was uh, 14 or 15, I watched the whole area behind my house in, in Howling get completely built out to a master plan community where I would ride my horse every day among, you know, rocks and and overgrown cactus and it was like I, I had moved from Sandusky, Ohio and I was living a John Wayne life like I was so John Wayne and I watched that become like literally a master plan community and I would muck around with the houses all the time like I would be like okay I'm gonna go like I'm gonna learn how to drywall and on a weekend I would go and try to put up drywall and then I'd get busted and take it back to my parents and <laughs> So it was really kind of, in the same way, of like, I got to go back at the age of 26 years old and begin to reinvestigate what this idea of master plan was. Um, this, this is a whole entire plexiglass floor that you would walk over in the installation. And so when you walked into the installation of the gallery the first year of it, um, I had made these 20 by 20 inches, and so they're 40 by 40 inch panels. Um, that were all, you know, kind of evidential photographs, almost like a, an archaeologist, so to speak, that we would dig at this site and find these things later on of what the construction workers had left behind. And so they were, you know, you, in, you walked over them as images versus like them being on the wall. And then, of course, the uh, model homes, how the community is sold. So the property is protected by an electronic warning device, please do not disturb furnishings. And why is the Book of Obedience next to it? Was that the designer of the model home? Like, you know, you, there's these decisions that are made that are really curious. And after making an enormous amount of photographs of model homes, of construction sites, of landscapes of the area, and really like mapping out this process for me to figure it out, um, it, I, I became aware that I was biased, <laughs> that I was definitely urban, and, and that I had no desire at all ever to return to any kind of um, upper middle class suburbia or middle class suburbia. And, but I felt that within that bias uh, kind of presentation of my thesis, that I needed to interview families about their choices. So this is the, uh, uh, this is the Dickinson family. And uh, so with them, they let me photograph their entire home in the same way that I photographed the model homes, and then I interviewed them of their choices of why they lived in a master plan community. This is, so this is my photograph of the family. This is their, you know, representation of their family. This obviously says it all. <laughs> so. And then just, you know, this is the Toronto family. This is a different family. I don't have their family portrait, but it just really ended up being these still lives amidst these completely absurd still lives of the model homes, which literally the girls' room would have cheerleading in it and the boys' room would have baseball paper. So it was like already completely gender specified in a certain way. And I was really curious, like, how much do they really want to live up to this? Like, how much are their homes actually going to, you know, somewhat be um, not inspired, I wouldn't use that word, but, uh, you know, almost copy the model home to a certain extent. Uh, this obviously dates it uh, with, uh, with family ties. Uh, this was definitely 80s. And from that, I moved back into the city. I did 200 photographs that were two different installations over a two-year period of time. 
and I got the heck out of there as fast as I could, and and uh, and also, uh, you know, got a car, and I ended up living um, right in MacArthur Park in an 1898 um, house, uh, right at the time that the Metro Rail was being built. And I became really, really curious about this um, kind of moment of the transformation of Los Angeles in terms of trying to bring a subway back. Because, I mean, we all know that there once existed a very, you know, very good public transportation system here that was taken down by, you know, tire companies, basically. And so I titled this body of work A Long Way From Paris. And so it opens with a panorama of a MacArthur Park Lake looking downtown. And you can see that, you know, if you really look in the background, a lot of the buildings are just starting to build. This is, so at this time that they're building the Metro Rail, this is also a boom for downtown Los Angeles, which once again, they were trying to relocate everything to downtown before again, the other economic bus. So downtown LA's history is this really complicated history of economical hope and boom and bust years all the way through its development. Um, and so I wanted to pare it down. After making 200 photographs, I decided that this body of work only needed five photographs. And I wrote with it a text that was basically kind of uh, channeling Raymond Chandler's voice about the politics of MacArthur Park and living in the neighborhood in which so many immigrants were getting burnt out of their homes because of the arson in relationship to them hoping that all of a sudden this would become, again, a thriving Westlake district. That it would no longer be MacArthur Park, but it would be returned to kind of its history of Westlake. And so this is a, this is a, 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 a statue of uh, the head of the uh, LA Times, a newsboy next to it. Uh, this is burnt down house. And I also had framed, um, I would walk the subway tunnel that was being built on Sundays. I would sneak in with my 4x5 camera over my shoulder and literally walk the entire tunnels going downtown kind of documenting it. And uh, there's another image of a tunnel under construction. And on either side of these pieces, there are actual artifacts. So going from the floor of the master plan, in which it was a photographic artifact, I then started taking actual artifacts from the site and framing them up. So really beginning to think about what 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 is that in between the notion of a document, the photograph as a document, and then actual kind of objects that, that one could recognize. In this one, uh, from this site of this burned down house, which had uh, four El Salvadorian families living in it. Um, there was uh, obviously melted Barbie dolls and so forth, but the album is Martin Luther King's Freedom of Speech. And um, in the subway, it was all the, uh, all the debris that the, the construction workers left behind. So in that, those panels, it was like what you would find, you know, snicker bars, things that construction workers were just tossing into the site. So after a long way from Paris, um, I was, I moved my practice from the outside to the inside, meaning that I, that I had built, you know, these kind of significant bodies of work with real quandaries in relationship to the specificity of identity in terms of communities that we live in and how we function in them and how they're built in relationship to, you know, certain sense of ideology of how we should live. Um, and I was uh, losing an enormous amount of friends uh, from AIDS. And so I started making portraits, and I'm not going to the portraits next, but there's a jump. So from, this ended in 89, and so from 1990 to 95, I made portraits. And in the studio of my friends, that you'll see some of them later on in the lecture. Um, after I made the portraits, the portraits kind of launched my career, so to speak, in the art world. And uh, not too many people had ever been that interested in my urban work, even though that was actually the thing that I thrived on, that I was most interested in. And once I became pretty well known for the portraits, and I was, you know, being, you know, included in Whitney Biennials and so forth, I was like, oh, 
fuck, this is great. But at the same time, I'm always going to be the leather dyke photographer and nobody will know these other things that I do or that I think about. And I was really, really clear that I didn't want to have a singular identity as an artist. That it was really important to try to begin to tie those other identities in relationship to how I viewed a totality of, of how we get constructed in relationship to identity. So I start, I was doing a commute, and these are very small prints, they're platinum prints. They look like a graphite on paper, but they're actually seven by 17, or, or no, six by 17 centimeter negatives that are then platinum printed. So that's where you hand coat the paper, and then you're exposing it to UV, and they really are, it's a very historic kind of process. And I was uh, driving from LA to Irvine five days a week and building the dark rooms down there and designing the entire uh, photo facility. And uh, I, you know, this was my landscape. This is what I began to really think about. And I wanted to go back to landscape and ideas of development. And I wanted to try to mirror something as material as platinum printing uh, to what I thought of as, you know, monumental uh, architecture, so to speak. That it was that, that in the same way that we look at the, you know, we go to the Getty and look at the photographs of the Egyptian monuments, that all of a sudden we would realize a certain kind of time period of civilization in relationship to 150 years from now, how we might look at these freeway structures. So I would go out on Sunday mornings, and I would wait on the side, pull my car over, and just wait in between kind of pods of traffic to get them completely empty. And it was, you know, this, I've never digitally manipulated any of my work. I still, even though um, there is such things to do so, I still am really very connected to the notion, which obviously we could argue for a really long time about, about what truth is. But I am, I am somewhat really fascinated with this notion of how photography acts as a document. And there is a certain kind of purism within that that I'm very attached to that I haven't been able to get over. So this would just be waiting. This was when um, the 105 was getting built and I would walk this whole thing like I walked the subway tunnel. And I was just fascinated with watching this kind of one of the great last freeways of, uh, of Los Angeles getting built. And there's also this kind of interesting sense of ownership that you get in relationship to um, being in model homes or being you know in master plan communities and being on this construction site that I find really fascinating because no longer would I ever be able to walk through that house again once it's done same thing with the 105 I'm not going up to the top of the 105 and walk on the ramp to get that view of McDonald's even though I really like it every time I see it um, on the way to the airport and there is something that I'm that that I'm connected to in a really interesting way. This is the 14 before the Northridge earthquake. This is now being completely rebuilt. Um, so this is you know this is predates the Northridge earthquake. This also this whole span is completely gone. So this was and I that that became. Another thing that I really was attached to in the same way that you were talking about history, you know, in the same way that maybe a building doesn't outlive, but a photograph does live as a document in a, in a certain way. And I all of a sudden realized that these maybe weren't uh, poignant um, in relationship to looking at them from 150 years from now, but that maybe this type of work actually can have a presence um, in terms of it being of now, of being of this time, and how quickly in our culture uh, things do shift. But there's a total of 40 of these, and they're usually hung, not ever linearly, but in groupings, almost as if you were traversing it. So you would, you know, go through two kind of straight freeways and all of a sudden get a group of three stacked. And so a lot of times when I'm doing installations, I'm very, very concerned with the installation as being almost a, as much about the architecture as I am in terms of making the work.
And the silence of them is important. And I find, uh, I mean, here there's cars in it. There was no way. I waited so long. <laughs> but you almost forget the, that you can even see the cars in these. So I would have to, you always have to break your rules, right? You go, okay, no cars, no cars. Same thing when I was doing the mini malls. I was like, okay, if there's, an, if there's a car in the parking lot, I walk away and I come back the next day. And it would be like the cars in the parking lot. Well, how bad is that car in the parking lot? How much is that bothering me? You know, it's just like on that photograph, the photograph was just too good not to uh, include it with the cars. Vasquez rocks. And one of the things is, you know, in making the freeways, in the same way of making the portraits and of the master plan, is I was very conscious of, again, kind of mapping out a, a sense of California. So that this is the 14 getting rebuilt after the uh, uh, Northridge earthquake. So this is like really pretty soon right after it. And there's only two night ones. And I wanted to do more night ones, but it's, it was very difficult how the platinum uh, works to, to get it right. This is just the staging ground for the for the 14 rebuilt, which really makes me think of you know kind of the Egyptian pyramids in, in the landscape and the last column after the earthquake. <laughs> and some of them, even though it was really interesting to kind of make the more grandiose ones, the what 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 some people would consider the more aestheticized ones of them crossing and underneath them, I also really wanted them to just act as landscapes. I needed that kind of super aestheticized moment along with just kind of the plain, almost banal landscape. Uh, and it was, you know, it was good to go back and forth. Like this one isn't grandiose whatsoever, but it's just as important as some of the other ones to me. And that is, is like those little moments of detail that happen about how things are constructed, or just the, the idea of how many engineers thought about kind of the patterning that should be in that cement. last one. So portraits, right? So this is what I was making before I made the freeways. And one of the things that I think is really important that I talk about with portraits is that I wasn't making black and white photographs of my friends and their environments. I was choosing to make these portraits in relationship to the idea that the body is also a site of architecture. That the body carries the sense of identity in relationship to the carvings, the piercings, the tattooings, and so forth that my friends were doing. So I looked at them almost as a site of building, to a certain extent, a building of identity in the same way that neighborhoods are built and so forth. And um, so it wasn't only about uh, really kind of um, documenting my community in a very fragile time, it was also my interest in relationship to the choices that we make as far as building an idea of identity. Justin Bond. Justin Bond's going to perform soon at the Red Cat, you guys. You should really go see Justin Bond perform. Justin Bond is amazing. Check it out. I think it's in February. So, after the freeways, all these people were kind of talking about, like, oh, I remember the first time that I showed the freeways was in Long Beach at the museum. 
and I heard, you know, I was kind of standing away from the work because you never want to stand near your work during an opening. It's just always so awkward. And uh, so I heard these people say, those aren't Catherine Opie's. They got the wall label wrong. Like, those aren't her photographs. <laughs> and uh, no, somebody was like, no, no, she's that, that, those are hers, you know? And so then I just decided to further mess with people's minds. And, uh, and I started this body of work called Beverly Hills and Bel Air Houses. And I'll have to say that these are the hardest photographs I've ever made to like. I think they are awkward. I think they, I, sometimes I don't know why I had to make them. Um, they are really, really awkward as, as I fall off my studio stool. Um, the thing that fascinated me about them is that in the same way, I wanted to try to make portraits of houses. So I don't think of these whatsoever as architectural photographs. I never attempted them as architectural photographs, but I attempted them as portraits. And to me, they ended up talking very much in relationship to my own friends borrowing from different histories as far as tattooing culture as it did of these kind of Beverly Hills and Bel Air houses. So you have these Pullman doors with, you know, these shake roofs and you just, you know, it's all kind of, it's all wrong in a certain way. And I became obsessed with how wrong these houses were. And how that everybody thought, like from 90210 and all of these shows, like, oh yeah, of course you want to live in Beverly Hills and Bel Air. And I just became really obsessed with these, like this certain specific time period of Beverly Hills and Bel Air, the late, the, the late you know, 1950s, in which a lot of these houses were being made, of how, um, how different they were from what people's own uh, iconic image of Beverly Hills and Bel Air is. And I think that I'm that, that is something that also is throughout all of the different bodies of work is almost trying to rewrite a new icon, a, a rewrite beginning a new way to to uh, look at these. I purposely made them look like bad real estate photographs, but they're taken with an eight by ten camera, so the prints are forty by fifty inches with an eight by ten negative that you can read every single detail including on the Manzard roof over there, the, 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 the fingerprints that looked like somebody fell. Like there's this dusty trail of fingerprints on the roof of somebody obviously, I don't know what they were doing, trying to climb or something, but something happened. But they're just, um, they're just awkward, you know? And they were about this kind of inside-outside thing. Like all of a sudden I was, you know, doing, being invited to these houses for parties by collectors. And they wanted me to, you know, they, I was in their collection, they wanted to talk to me, and I'm like, okay, I'm, the, you know, I live in MacArthur Park, what am I going to say to these people, like, what's going on here, you know, and I just, all of a sudden I became, like, fascinated with doing these, uh, these portraits, these exteriors. And I studied the light. It took me two years to make them because I would go and I would study the light on the houses. They weren't just like all of a sudden driving along and setting up your 8x10 camera and shooting them, even though they look really arbitrary as images. They were really, it was really quite an intensive study to try to get these right. And, you know, all the little security signs in them, and uh, yeah, they're just absurd. <laughs> This one just looks like a pure facade, that there's no house that, that could go beyond that hill. And I love that, that it becomes like very Hollywood in that way, in which it does look like a facade. Like, I wouldn't buy that in Beverly Hills or Bel Air. I mean, I appreciate it. But see what I mean by the roof and the columns, and then you have those doors, and you're just like, okay. <laughs> Sorry if anybody designed these, and I'm consulting them. <laughs> but I also love them, and actually, there's some of them that I could totally imagine living in. I think it's one of these things where it's like, it's so bad that it's so good. 
This is one of my favorites and when I had an exhibition, um, uh, which was a really interesting exhibition, a group show of LA artists that, that happened in uh, Denmark. Um, and it, it really interesting, Sunshine and Noir, the show was called. I placed, uh, the curator placed this image of the house and it really tied the portraits in really well together with uh, self-portrait fervor. Like all of a sudden self-portrait fervor like had this kind of also architectural weight to it in a certain way, uh, just as much as the, the kind of decorative great of, of this house. And it is in the same way that they are very exchangeable to me, that they are, uh, you know, they do come out of the same language, the same place. Um, then after I made those houses, I bought an RV and I went around the country for three and a half months and I photographed lesbians in their homes. So all of a sudden the front doors that are, that are closed in a certain sense to me uh, became these scenes with, which were also taken with an 8x10 camera. So this is Miggy and Eileen in Los Angeles, Tammy Ray and Kaya in North Carolina, uh, Juliet and, uh, and uh, uh, Kim. In, in New York, uh, Melissa and Lake in North Carolina, uh, Harry, Flipper, Chloe, and uh, Tanya in um, San Francisco, and then we get to American cities, a long love affair of mine. This is where maybe some of you will go to sleep, but I hope not. Okay, so American City started off with Los Angeles, and I bought a 7x17 seven inch uh, banquet camera that was made for me by an amazing camera maker by the name of Keith Canham, who still makes cameras in Arizona. And he was, a, he was an, amazing, uh, an incredible uh, aeronautic engineer who just really makes some of the most beautiful large format cameras you could ever imagine. So the negatives are actually 7x17 seven inches. And so you're out there like with an old kind of, you know, camera. And, and uh, I wanted to do a series following the freeways of LA mini malls. Um, because in the same way that the freeways have this kind of monumental, significant uh, specificity of identity of Southern California, the mini malls are completely specific to Los Angeles identity in relationship to mapping out communities in LA. So you know that you're, you know, when you're in Koreatown, you know when you're in South Central, you know that when you're in Little Armenia and so forth, that all of this kind of small mom and pop businesses are mapped out through these facades of the mini malls. And they're also like those Beverly Hills houses in a certain way, like what is purely iconic of the city, but is never celebrated. And so to make something as formal as these photographs of mini malls in a certain way began to fulfill this kind of uh, sense that, that even though we all hate these structures as well, that these structures are also worthy to look at and begin to decipher in relationship to the development of community and also the American dream. So, uh, so you know, these prints were then, uh, I tried to make platinum prints of these images and they didn't work, I didn't like them. They, they ended up just not working at all because it was all about the signage. So I had the seven by 17 inch negative scan and then I outputted them on iris printing, which isn't around anymore. And so the images, the, the, they're about 40 inches by 22 inches or so as, as prints. And you can really, with a 717 negative, just like the 8x10 negative, you can utterly get into every single little detail. Like up above the acupuncture sign, it, over there on the right hand corner, I don't have a detail of it, but if you saw the print, there's razor wire that is then decorated with Christmas lights thrown in. And you just have to appreciate that kind of acupuncture, razor wire, and Christmas light combination in that little <laughs> moment of the print. Sunset and Tower. With, with the work, I'm very interested in the notion of wandering. So one of the things that Louis Baltz does that I really appreciate about Louis Baltz as a photographer 
is that he will tell you exactly where he is. So when you go back to the Irvine Industrial Parks and so forth and you look at those images, you can literally map it out through his descriptions. Mine are all untitled. You don't know where I am. You have to kind of wander the city and think that maybe you found one of my photographs. And I'm okay with that because I kind of like the sense in, in a certain way, I'm, I'm very interested in the way that um, the, that Rebecca Solden begins to talk about landscape and this notion of wandering and kind of the discovery in it versus, and that's, that's the little part of me that is the part of me that begins to reject the notion of being a documentary photographer, where it goes a little bit more in a con kind of conceptual way of the fact that I'm wandering. Now this mini mall, this is the one on uh, Sunset Down in Silver Lake. They have tried so many different facades on this to try to line it up, and it's just never going to really make it. I think now, is it turquoise now? I tried turquoise one time, and they've really tried hard. I like that this one is dedicated all to cleaning. <laughs> so. So some of them are about mini malls that I frequented, and some of them are just literally about mapping out the city. But I have to say that there are no Santa Monica West Side mini malls. That the farthest west that I go is around Westwood, and I I never went farther west than that. And maybe that's because I've been I have never lived past Normandy. My entire existence in Los Angeles has always been east of Normandy. So <laughs> I don't know if it's because of that or what. And this one, in a certain way, is it begins to be almost the most apocalyptic one. It is where the city is virtually completely empty. And even though I spent a lot of time on Sunday mornings hoping for it to be empty, to actually kind of be able to see all the way down um, Olympic at that hour, and just like combination of the mini mall with the church behind it and the Dodger flags and everything, this has ended up being like this kind of very poignant one for me that felt different than actual little other ones that were very frontal. It had more emotion in it. It had more, a little bit more despair in it. Uh, St. Louis, in between here and there. The title uh, derives from that I left Southern California in 1999 and moved to the East Coast to New York uh, to take a teaching position at Yale. So literally I was doing a body of work uh, in St. Louis um, as I was uh, accepted this job at Yale. And it, see, in St. Louis being the middle of the country as well, um, I felt like a good title would be in between here and there. And I looked at St. Louis as far as its specificity of identity, and this is where I began to stretch out, where it became no longer just about Los Angeles and trying to create this mapping of an LA identity, but also what, what do other cities contain in terms of a history that they can't let go of, that they uphold as one of the most important moments in terms of a, of, of, of a, of a city's history. And in St. Louis, it was the uh, World's Fair. That for them, that was the pinnacle of, of them being ahead of Chicago and like really they were going to become the kind of uh, city of, of that uh, region. And so this is, the amazing thing about the World Fair is that it was all temporary buildings. And this is the site of one of the uh, permanent buildings from the World Fair, which is the St. Louis Art Museum, overlooking the park in which the World Fair was staged at. This is the existing, uh, the, uh, the only existing fence from the World's Fair. And so one of the things about photographing St. Louis is that I didn't have to wait on Sunday mornings. Now, this is Friday in the middle of the afternoon. I probably even rush hour. And I, I became more fascinated with kind of mapping St. Louis around the idea of the specificity of identity of the World's Fair 
but also from the park to the river. So it was like really working those boulevards all the way to the Mississippi in terms of, of looking at it. And kind of the culmination of what tried to be new in a vibrant city by building stadiums on, you know, next to older buildings and just how conflicted of an identity as a major urban city that St. Louis has had you know, for, I would say, the past like three decades easily. And so you would have brand new houses built, decorated with Halloween decorations and more brand new houses built across the street. Meanwhile, these amazing old brick buildings completely uh, dilapidated and, and left to, to basically rot and be empty. And this kind of, um, I find this, this kind of schizophrenia in a certain way of preservation um, very, um, very shocking, the same way that I'm fascinated with what's going on in Detroit right now, as probably most urban planners and developers are. And um, really actually want to photograph Detroit, but it's hard to haul out that 717 camera again, let me tell you. But it's, you know, these kind of images, and just, I will throw an image of all of a sudden the tree in, because it's a very photographic moment. Like, that is my moment where all of a sudden Robert Adams or someone begins to enter the work that goes beyond just the kind of recording of the urban environment. Um, on, the, uh, on the right is the power plant, which was the largest power plant built in the United States during the World Fair at that time. And the, for the, one of the longest train trestles ever built. And then, of course, you can't do St. Louis without having the arch in it. It would be a crime to photograph St. Louis and not have. But just an incredibly abandoned city. There's so much possibility, as many of the American cities are. In a certain way, the American cities, is, it's complicated for me because I think that so much of it is this kind of focus on what happens with urbanity in relationship to a development of hope around the notion of the American dream and then what is left behind after that uh, doesn't succeed. Um, Ice Houses and Skyways, uh, I started in 2001. And I became fascinated with the ice houses in relationship to the idea of a temporary community. That all of a sudden this, this, this happens every winter for generations and generations where people have their, you know, either really nice ones or really shitty ones. They pull them out on the ice and they like set up a community. And usually around the lake, it's only the pretty expensive houses. But you know, the car mechanic can have the, his ice house next to the whatever guy. Um, and I wanted to, I, I started photographing them and I really thought about the notion of the landscape in as panorama as so much of my work had done, uh, had, had been really looking at. And then I realized that I really was interested in trying to create a fractured panorama. So as you go through them, you'll notice that the horizon line is always in the middle. And with that horizon line being in the middle, um, and when I uh, install all 14 of them up, it becomes an extended panoramic landscape, but it's fractured. And I think that in a certain way that that begins to be about a metaphor of the temporal nature of community in itself and how we begin to you know, try to decipher it or look at it or think about it in those ways. And, uh, and, you know, and in the 14, as you go through them, um, they go from closer to farther away to beginning to disappear into the landscape. So I was the only one flying to uh, Minnesota hoping for a blizzard because I wanted it to be white on white. I really wanted that white on white kind of effect to happen and for these houses to become a little bit more abstract. And that's more of my love of painting than of architecture. That's where I'm getting into rhyme, and that's like where I'm getting into like other things that just like drive me crazy on a visual level. And so it has much more to do not with a metaphor necessarily of how I think about temporal communities, but more of an aesthetic decision in relationship to how I want somebody to move through the work as an installation. And then with it, 
was a series of skyways that were done uh, in the same format with the 717 camera. And I'll have to say, I really think that skyways are kind of unbelievably fascinating. And I didn't print these as big. I kept them a little bit smaller because I, and I installed them in the same way that I installed the freeways. They couldn't just live as these big prints kind of on their own. They had to move in and out in the same way that they did through the buildings. And um, you can walk, you know, over seven miles through downtown uh, Minneapolis without having to go outside. And some of them are trying so hard architecturally. And others are just purely functional. And I'm always curious in terms of that idea of design, you know, of like what tries only to just be functional or you kind of can figure out the budget of those buildings and the connecting skyway and, uh, and other ones that actually a building has been taken down and there's no attachment of the skyway to the other building. And they're like, you know, there's just this, it's so much a part of, in the same way that the freeways are part of the landscape and the specificity of identity of LA, um, you can't think of St. Paul or Minneapolis without thinking about what the skyways do. So these are also taken all on Sunday morning. And it, uh, it took a period of about a year and a half of flying in and out to really kind of map out downtown. I love this one because the movie theater is Skyway and then there's a Skyway in the background. This is the one. See, no building. It doesn't go to anything. And while I was doing this body of work, um, 9-11 happened, and I had just photographed Wall Street, which you'll see, and it's for Chicago, I forget which one else one is. And all of a sudden, I was, no, I was being stopped all the time about why I was photographing these skyways. There was an incredible threat that they felt of me under my, you know, dark cloud with the 717 camera. And so I was finding myself having to carry ID and actually having people out and letters from the museum from the walker that I was doing this body of work. And I, uh, would, you know, the cops tried to shut me down over and over again. They felt very threatened, like I was going to plan some kind of terrorist attack through their series of uh, skyways. <laughs> Yeah, I like this one too, right? It's a nice one. Like, okay, you did something with that skyway. I like this one too. I think that's a nice skyway. This one not. And then these came up everywhere. God bless America on all the skyways. Um, so it was the time of incredible, um, you know, uh, fortitude of, of patriotism that we began to witness um, the buildings. So also in 2001, I did Wall Street. And my interest in Wall Street is not only from a historical perspective of how Wall Street has been photographed through Bernice Abbott through years of amazing New York photographers, but to also try to realize that the verticality of uh, New York was always discussed, but never, uh, never was really panoramic made. They're always talking about, you know, the incredible verticality. And what I found with this was that I could still really register the verticality of New York, but make kind of Western landscapes, so to speak. So this is a, this is a skyway as well, but this is no longer there. This was um, actually a collector came up to me and told me that he has this piece because he was actually able to run from the trade towers, and this is how he escaped before they collapsed. And so again, just like the freeways, all of a sudden this body of work changed. I literally made it 
I have photographed the bottom of the trade towers, and two weeks later, that no longer existed as a site. I was in LA buying a house, moving back here to my, I took a teaching position here, and I'm still here. And, um, and I was starting to edit this body of work for an exhibition in New York. And all of a sudden, this, this thing weighed on me. Like, how do, you, how do you make a body of work of something that is somewhat banal in relationship to the realist, you know, just of what Wall Street looks like beyond the meaning, but now it's imbued with all of this meaning that you can't even deal with. And so I had the body of work, uh, the exhibition, but it ended up being very much a memorial. And I never really wanted to think about this body of work as a memorial, but it, it just, it was lousy timing. And it's interesting because when the Northridge earthquake happened and I did the freeway photographs, there was no sense of memorial in that. You know, like, it, because, I mean, you know, yes, li lives were lost on the freeways, but it was not this grand kind of terrorist uh, attack against the country. And uh, so, in these like moments of like you know kind of thinking of Bernice Abbott and just thinking about what it is to to photograph one of the most powerful pieces of real estate on an economic level that looks like this you know is really like that was what I was trying to do that was the fascinating idea of it for me it's like okay like you know this, this, these, this is some, this is some major money down here to be down here, and then, I mean, just like leftover bricks. I was, I set this photograph up. You know, it takes about an hour and a half to two hours to really make the 717 totally perfect. And uh, th this guy rolled up in front of the, in his car, opened his, his back of his car, and he started loading all of these cobblestones in the back of his car. And I was like, uh, can you stop that? It was like, no. And I said, well, you, you're ruining my composition. <laughs> so. And this is the bottom of the tray towers. And at the time, there was a fire at the Millennium Hotel behind me. So oddly enough, I swung the 717 camera around and I started photographing the firefighters. And those were all firefighters that had lost their lives uh, uh, two weeks afterwards. And it was just so odd to think that something, again, that you're trying to make on a historical level is just slammed in your face right away. But I love this kind of, you know, I mean, this kind of photograph just kills me in terms of its layers. It's like. You have the scaffolding talking about the gourmet store, and then you have you know this crazy sculpture, and just the culmination of what happens with these objects in the frame are really begins to excite me in, in terms of like thinking about what a photograph can do. And the, these days, it would be impossible to set up a 7x17 camera down there and be able to actually document it in this way. I mean, they, they really wouldn't allow it. And forever, all the sight lines are changed. So this sight line going from Wall Street through the back there is the trade tower. And then, but you have this layer in this photograph of Trinity to a different building to the trade tower, and those sight lines are all taken away now. Chicago, last American city, you guys are hanging in pretty well. The first people that have ever gone through all of them with me. <laughs> you get a medal after this. So Chicago, the specificity and identity of Chicago was how they liked their architecture at night. There is no other city that I have ever been to that has the most amazing lighting designers do it. So the Wrigley Building just glows all night long, you know. And uh, so with it, I was really kind of trying to play around with almost what would become like iconic postcard shots to like really bringing it down to a different level of describing the city as well. 
So these would, you know, this is, of course, you know, I mean, everybody always does the, the buildings with, with, the, with the two corn stalks uh, next to each other, but I made it like one. And then all of a sudden, this corner over here where I'm allowing that planter to come in becomes kind of an at J moment for me. So I'm like kind of skewing and mushing up history a little bit in terms of uh, these compositions. So, sorry for a uh, This is the ba back of the Hancock building. So I found, like, my importance was the parking structure, the, like, mini Guggenheim parking structure at the back of the, the Hancock building versus, like, the actual, I'm trying to make this perfect photograph of the Hancock building. And it's, you know, just cityscapes. Wandering around all night long. And I love this, like, this kind of, you know, older Chicago building next to the more modern Chicago building. Chinatown. This is uh, this is now all apartment buildings, but I love this kind of layer of the grid of the bridge with the apartment buildings in the back. But that was the largest uh, kind of um, uh, distributor of Montgomery Ward. That was their headquarters. Mies van der Rohe. But the thing that's, that, that's important to me is like not only trying to make this a perfect photograph as far as the panorama, but what's better for me is what follows it, which is Lower Wacker. That Lower Wacker becomes just as important as a Mies van der Rohe on, on Lakeshore Drive. It really is an incredible photo, uh, city to photograph from. Uh, Cabrini Greens next to this very old church. And now Cabrini Greens is completely gone. You know, it's been, thank goodness it's gone. It needed to be gone. Uh, one of the worst public housing projects in, in America's history. Uh, this is, uh, this is um, oh God, Burnham. It's, uh, it's his office building. I loved it because he was the one who invented the skyscraper. Who? Yeah, the rookery, exactly. It's the rookery. And but it's it's lined out in scaffolding. And then, you know, so it's like all of a sudden you're looking at the rookery, but it's it's being, you know, under construction. And then with it was the four seasons of uh, Lake Michigan. So you would go through all these Chicago prints and then you would have these the four seasons of Lake Michigan. Um, this is the beginning of something that I've never finished. And this is the Hall of Architecture in, uh, at the Carnegie in Pittsburgh. And it's one of my favorite places to go in the entire world. And I love the idea that all these buildings were cast and brought by Carnegie for the people. And what blows me, the, 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 the juxtaposition that I was going to do with this body of work was that I was going to uh, do 7 by 17 inch photographs, uh, use the camera, the Bengal camera, to photograph all the empty steel mill sites. So that I would, that just like the, the, the hall of architecture and this idea of bringing the great architecture of the world to the people, I was then mirrored with the abandoned steel mill sites. And so this is a pro, this is, all I've done is documented the hall of architecture. Um, and, uh, and kind of, again, I'm int interested in the triptych as a fracture of history, of playing with fracturing that history, actually, with a line in it. Um, surfers followed ice houses, and I just threw them in here because it's another way that I look at landscape in relationship to a temporal community. And uh, at the Guggenheim, I had my dream where all 14 surfers were across from all 14 ice houses, and it was a perfect moment of installing work. I just threw them in here because they're really pretty. And I thought after a bunch of black and white photographs of buildings, you might want to look at like you know people in the water waiting to surf. <laughs> in and around home. So after all of this very very formal work 
in terms of mapping out cities and like just being really, really tight within my bodies of work, I became interested in going back to my roots of being kind of a street photographer. And I had made this body of work called 1999, which you won't see, but this body of work is a companion to it. And there's a book called 1999 and in and around home that was published in relationship to this. And 1999 was my examination of American landscape right before the millennium, where the quaint fear of Y2K, uh, where we thought we were all going to lose our information when all the banks went back to zero. And so I felt like that body of work of American landscapes kind of hung out there by itself. It had its own moment. It was interesting, but it needed a conversation piece. So after Bush got elected, and this was the re-election of President uh, Bush, uh, I decided to make a body of work called In and Around Home. I live in West Adams by USC in uh, South Central, basically. They named it West Adams to think that we don't live in South Central, but we basically, you know, it is South Central on the edge of it. And, uh, you know, we're a lesbian, how, we're a lesbian household in a very diverse, interesting neighborhood. And, um, and we've had to navigate in very interesting ways. And so this is titled Sunday Morning Breakfast, where Oliver is not eating his scrambled eggs but talking to our dogs. Uh, this is Monica Lewinsky, a mural of Monica Lewinsky. So I wanted to like deal with like the idea of what identity is in a neighborhood, how to begin to look at it. And then with it, I did Polaroids off the TV. So this is a character from Days of Our Lives going off to war, uh, to Iraq. Philip, he goes to war. And then Bush thumbs up, and then Judge Dykes, because I just had never seen a Judge Dykes before. So. <laughs> this is a blonde news reporter, a brunette news reporter. This is uh, Robert E. Lee Boulevard from Katrina, underwater. So Katrina was happening at this time. This is titled Abandoned TV. This is Adelon Market. Uh, my partner Julie with her dog Myra. Our daughter Sarah with her dog Momo. And a portrait of me by Julie with my dog Nika, who passed away two days after this photograph. So we really wanted to add it to the girls with their dogs. Um, uh, just a neighborhood sign, vote against President Bush. Martin Luther King parade. This is a memorial to a bloods. So a gang member had gotten shot on our block, and this was the, the memorial. But it's really important how reflection works in this body of work and shadow. So I'm in it. And it's important that I'm reflected within the balloon as I'm part of the neighborhood. A self-portrait voting booth. A Terry Schiavo and the Pope. Remember all these news stories, you guys? See, that's why it's important to document them with Polaroid. The, oh, let me explain Polaroid. At this point, I'm using Polaroid as a medium for the television because the news is immediate and Polaroid is immediate, but at this point it's also the truthful image in which that, doc that, that digital photography has completely taken over. So I wanted to like use Polaroid as not only in its idea of instantaneousness, but it was mirroring, uh, mirroring it in terms of the document and, and also then Polaroid was gone after that. Mural of the Pope. 31 sex offenders is too many to live in one house, and that's a protest against 31 registered sex offenders living in a house in our neighborhood. A USC tailgate party. A Martin Luther King parade shot. Uh, Rumsfeld defending the war. Cindy Sheehan's protest stopped the war. The most deaths in Iraq and then end the occupation of Iraq. Oliver in a tutu. <laughs> Purple finger. This is when the younger members of the House of Representatives before the State of the Union address uh, dipped their finger in purple ink in solidarity of bringing democracy to Iraq. But in my framing of it, it's the white hand of democracy and slowly the uh, Iraqi uh, national next to him is, appears within the photographs. So it's all about this, you know, white of democracy. 
push doctrine spread when he is reelected. Obama. <laughs> Carrie, I had lots of pictures of Carrie that ended up being this. <laughs> uh, this flag hung in our house the whole entire time of the Bush administration, which said, we the people say no to the Bush agenda, and then my Christmas tree in the foreground. But I like that the Christmas tree is this kind of black Christmas tree, you know, with just these little lights of hope, little, little hopeful lights. This is titled Debate. <laughs> This is titled, Talking to the Bush. <laughs> this is three crosses and a shadow. Terry Schiavo, A Religious Moment. Stolen Converses, this young girl stole this pair of red Converses and the police are on the corner talking about what they should do about her and the stolen Converses because her parents called the police on her. And she's as sad as my cat. <laughs> Bush smiles, help us. A very interesting still life from a USC tailgate party. A neighborhood pupaseria. Neighborhood garage, our local ice cream truck, which is this is really great. I, this is a side story. I had a group of collectors come out from Boston to do a studio visit, 40 of them, and I have a really small studio, so it was really interesting to try to fit 40 people in my studio. It's behind my house in West Adams. And after the studio visit, the ice cream truck went by and they all raced for soft serve. And I was just like, that guy is so happy. 40 people right now are buying soft serve. Uh, the confirmation hearing of Judge Roberts. Jesus carved out of a stump. Oliver and Stingray. My studio, Suzanne's work. Firefighters, LAPD helicopter, and then the body of work ends on optimism, which is a rainbow kite fly. And then I'm going to show you the last body of work, because Sylvia told me to show it to you guys. I wasn't going to show it to you, but then she emailed me saying that you guys wanted to see this. So um, I, after being called Catherine Opie American Photographer, I thought that was a pretty heavy title to live up to. I enjoyed it. That was nice that uh, Jenny Blessing decided to say Catherine will be an American photographer for the Night Show. But I decided, well, maybe it's time to go somewhere else. Maybe it's time not to be an American photographer. I'll go to Venice because I've always loved Canaletto. And Canaletto has always been so informative of my work, you know. And uh, so I went to Venice and I photographed every single day and I was going to try to explore Canaletto. And I had my panorama camera with me because Canaletto did amazing panoramas and everything was like this, you know, I hired a boat driver with all the books on Canaletto to go to all the spots to re-photograph them, which is highly unusual for me. And I made a body of work that has nothing to do with Canaletto, surprising enough. And so my Venice <laughs> ended up being square. Like, they weren't panoramas, but they were just these square moments of light and kind of architecture that began to get blurred, and it, it just became very quiet of my friend Karen, like, just, you know, looking out at the boat. Um, all of a sudden, this became a California wave for me. So it's like all looking, you know, into the lagoon for any sign of, like, place or home. And the, the, that was so interesting that I was trying to find home in one of the most beautiful places anybody could spend two months of their entire life. Uh, this became a little piece of California for me. It was like my mountain that I found out in the lagoon. Um, then I began to fracture these landscapes so that the aisle would be fractured in a certain way because it, everything was almost too pretty. 
like how do you deal with something that only resonates in a history of extreme beauty and that has been overly represented, like utterly overly represented? It's almost impossible. So a self-portrait of me in a bathroom thinking about how the fuck to photograph this place. <laughs> I spent a lot of time in that red bathroom thinking about how to photograph this place. That's my boat driver, driver Gio Franco. Um, so it became like these little moments of experience. Like this is a column outside of where I stayed. Uh, this is me again thinking about what the fuck to do here. <laughs> You know, but also somewhat, somewhat of a classical portrait. Um, uh, the fish market, my favorite place. So, you know, I mean, everything was just so steeped in its own nostalgia of history of place. So it's like the fact that all of a sudden, the, when I photograph this, it's got a garbage boat behind it because it's the only way to dislocate it in my mind. And then this isn't actually how they're fractured. This is unfortunately just, you know, uh, what I threw in for the lecture, but I want to show you what the pieces really look like. So they look like this. So they're floated inside the frame, and then, you know, they're mounted and uh, on aluminum, and then the fracture is really just this black line in between. So they don't have a white line. They're, they float as fractured. And then this is just an installation shot. And then the piece of De Resistance that's kind of like Canaletto is the Rendentori. And the Rendentori is done as a celebration for the end of the play. And you've got to really appreciate a place that still celebrates the end of the play. It's <laughs> a uh, fireworks show. And uh, I'm going to leave you on that, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. We can turn the house lights on, and thank you very much. Thank you. When you were starting out, were you uh, attracted to, maybe even influenced by, the German photographers, Bert and Philip Becker? Well, yeah, a little bit, but actually not so much so as the, I mean, even though they were included in the, the new topographic show, I would say that I was looking at like Joe Deal and Robert Adams more than the Beckers. I always liked their work a lot. And I still, I mean, when I see an installation of the work, I am just head over heels in love with it. But they were, um, they were too systematic in a certain way. And even though I appreciate how systematic they are, because I somewhat am rigorous in terms of my formality, I also want light to all of a sudden take over certain areas. And I feel that that's needed in terms of being able to move people in and out of the work. But I love the work. Any other question? Uh, some of us are studying abandonment in American cities. That's a good thing to study. Yeah, I was just wondering like, what your reaction to that study is in your photos, even though it's kind of forced, like you said, you know, like Yeah, I mean, it is, it is forced. It, uh, but it, I feel that as soon as people uh, become part of the scene, and now I'm not, I mean, every it's like if you look at the work now, it's all about all of a sudden, the, the landscape being filled with people, but for the, this pat, you know, for that period of time, it needed to be empty because I wanted the uh, specificity of identity to only be within the architecture. And as soon as you have a person in the photograph, you go to that person. You just, you, you know, and I didn't want it to mirror street photography. It was really important that it had somewhat of an aesthetic or came out of a place of street photography, but that it was much more formal than that and as soon as you put people in it it just it mucked it up in my mind and i wanted it to be kind of metaphorical about our kind of the hopes and the dreams that we place in relationship to these urban environments and that so much of often areas become abandoned such as st louis 
And so the abandonment did work to a certain extent, even though it's not necessarily the reality. I mean, Wall Street, no, we know that it's like constantly filled. So, you know, then occupy. So. Maybe last question for today. Can you speak a bit more about um, dislocation and I mean, you speak about it in the Venice photographs, but also in American cities. I mean, I think in a certain way, I'm, I'm not as dislocated in terms of figuring out a specificity of identity of American cities, because I'm really fascinated by American history and American culture to a certain extent, and it's you know, and and what it's been trying to do as it, it's formed, you know, this this landscape that is not that old. Um, I'm more dislocated from probably a place like Venice because of the uh, just the uh, intensity of that history as well as unbelievably represented. Not saying that Chicago hasn't been represented through the hilt in relationship to a photographic process, but I don't think that, um, I can't think of anybody really who's tried to set out you know, kind of taking specific American histories and trying to loop in this this notion of a specificity of identity in a documentary form in the way that I've tried to do as an artist. I don't think that I can really name another artist that's tried to do that. I think if you guys know of one, I would love to know that so I could research it. But, I mean, I plan on doing Pittsburgh, I want to do Houston, I want to do Detroit. There's a certain other cities that I'm interested in trying to go in and do. It's just a matter of finding the time to actually do it, and this was all post, you know, pre me being a mom, and um, you can't just go up and live someplace for a year anymore and really study it. Um, so you might have to wait another ten more years until he's in college. <laughs> I like Levitt. Yeah, I like Helen Levitt a lot. I mean, her New York work. I mean, all of the work that was done in New York, you know, is, is completely fascinating. Yeah, that was, yeah. Okay, thank you. So please give another round of applause. Thank you.